Hey there, Haskell Weekly listeners. Welcome back to the Haskell Weekly podcast. It's supposed to be weekly, but it's been about a month since our last one. Apologies for that. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the Director of Software Engineering at ACI Learning, and with me today, as per usual, is Cam. Thanks for joining me, Cam. Well, hello, hello. It's good to be back. I know we've been trying to do this for a little bit, uh, but yeah, my name's Cam Guerra. Uh, I am a Senior Software Engineer at Moto Refi, so uh, yeah, excited to be here today, and uh, we got some fun stuff, um, recent release in the Haskell uh, ecosystem, and so we're excited to share that with you guys, and um, honestly, just spend some time and break it down, be a little more casual today, um, you know, get get to hear, because I haven't, you know, really heard what Taylor's been up to in a minute. So, uh, Taylor, what, what's been going on over at ACI Learning? All kinds of stuff. The big ticket item is merging with Practice Labs, uh, who is not exactly a competitor of ours, but another company in the same space who has a complementary skill set and product offering. So. Uh, my life recently has been talking with the folks over at Practice Labs and trying to identify some commonalities between our engineering orgs. What can we share? What do we do differently? What do we each, uh, which unique skills do each of us bring to the table and can we share with each other? So that's been going great. Really looking forward to continuing that. Um, and for me personally, I've uh, been doing some work on the Brittany code base, which is a Haskell source code formatter uh, that we use here at ACI Learning. And it hasn't been updated to support GHC 9.0, um, which came out a while ago. And today we're going to be talking about 9.2, but um, I'm trying to bring it up to date and uh, make it work so that it can be used as part of HLS. Ooh, nice. Yeah, we uh, haven't been using uh, Brittany. We used it for a minute, uh, but we've been focusing more so on Formaloo. So we're using Formaloo's, I don't know, customizational, customizable brother, Formaloo, and uh, that's been surprisingly good. Um, I know there's a couple more things that still need to be implemented in Formaloo to make me not, uh, my eyes not burn um, when I'm looking at, you know, some Haskell code. Because uh, right now, like, oh, dude, the one that's most frustrating to me is the trailing arrows. So if you have a function with multiple parameters and in the type signature, if you have it, you know, oh so long and you want to divvy it up, it's like everything's at the end of the line. And it's, I'm like, ah, I don't like this. It's just, it's just different from the norm. Um, if you're a normal user, I, I get it. You, you like that, that's cool. Yeah, I've always said that I don't really care what the formatting looks like. I just care that it's automated. But Ormaloo has really pushed that, pushed me to be honest about that. Like I do care a little bit about how it looks and I don't like how Ormaloo looks, but I do like everything else about that project. Like it's well maintained and they have a lot of good tools and they have like check mode and they have a GitHub actions for running it. I think all that stuff is great and I'm gonna try to do the same for Brittany. Nice, that'll be good. Yeah, I mean, when we were kind of thinking since, you know, really last time, since the last time we've talked, uh, you know, at, Motor Refi, we've just been all out on uh, creating a new product. And that's really what, you know, the team I'm on and, and what we're focusing on. So um, for me, it was, all right, we just need to pick a formatter for now and go with it. And so I, we thought about Brittany, started about Ormaloo, and then Formaloo was there. And I was like, all right, I, I can get on board with Formaloo. Like, that's fine. Let's, let's move forward with it. So, um, you know, I didn't really make too much of a fuss about it either um, because at the same time like you said it, it's automated like as long as it's automated and it works we're good um that, that's what we care about so uh, that's you know kind of my, my stance on where where we're at at the moment so other than source code formatting what else have you been up to you said building a new product that's exciting greenfield is always fun yeah 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 it's been fun so um we've been kind of the the previous product was a monolith with it's giant code Ruby code base, um, and we're not touching that. So <laughs> we're actually um, actually going though with a microservice architecture um, with event sourcing. And so um, at the beginning, I was a little bit like, "Wait, what? Why? Why are we doing this?" Um, and I'm still like, every once in a while, like, ah, "I wish we had like more shared code." But we're really trying to get better about bounded context, and that's kind of the whole push for uh, event event sourcing and uh, microservices. So 
you know, we created four new services in the last month that um, kind of uses event bus as more or less, or event log as more or less a means to do actions. Um, you know, so obviously we have an endpoint that will take the information uh, that is needed and push it into this event log event stream. And then we'll have, we have a couple services who listen to various uh, events on that event log. And so that was, uh, it's been fun. It's, I was impressed with how fast we were able to iterate. Um, we got all four services up with a week before our deadline. Um, and so uh, it was, yeah, all out. Um, and now we're just kind of starting to add some more services and different uh, things that we wanted to be able to do after MVP. So Monday is our official launch. Would you say that's the uh, power of Haskell? You're able to deliver qu more quickly than the old fashioned Ruby services? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's just proven that you know, Haskell does really work well in production. And you know you can start up a whole Greenfield project and have it done in three weeks. Uh, and that's because that's what we did, you know, and it's, you know, obviously kudos to our team. Our team did a great job, uh, but also kudos to Haskell. It gave us that opportunity just to start, go. Compiler is going to help us hold our hand along the way and, and you know, we'll, we'll kind of make choices and ideally, they're, generally, they're pretty good choices. So, you know, we are using Servant as like our server um, and that was kind of, you know, repeated through for like a health check for each service just to make sure that the thing was up and running. Um, and so that, you know, was all pretty easy. And actually another cool thing we got to do in that process was create a stack template because a lot of our services have the same core. And so we, anytime we need to start up a new service, we just do stack new, the name of it and the template name and boom, you got all the lines of code you need generated for you. Uh, what the name populated through. So that was uh, a pretty cool like experiment we did um, as after we created the first service, we did that to create the rest of the services and it uh, set us up for success there for sure. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks for sharing. I look forward to hearing more in the coming weeks about how this project develops. Um, Cause I'm sure like you mentioned, you know, just picking a formatter or just getting some something out there is really good. And I think one of the strengths of Haskell is being able to change it later, refactor it confidently. So I'm curious to see if y'all have any interesting refactoring stories. Oh yeah, that's that's our after after lunch. We have a, our next sprint is to kind of come back together, talk about the decisions we made, figure out if that's really what we want to do, get some consistency in the code base. Because you know, do we want to qualify imports? Do we want to, you know? just import the whole freaking module <laughs> like well how do we want to write our code so that's something we're going to be coming back to uh, so i'm sure i'll be able to update you guys with that next week and the following uh, weeks so because our goal is to make haskell weekly is this the goal weekly being the keyword there well uh so let's get into some of the news from this week uh we'll start with maybe the the smaller ticket item which is the haskell weekly survey, the state of Haskell survey, um, is out. It, I released it on November 1st and it will be open for two weeks, which is through November 15th. Uh, I do this every year. I've done it for the past four years. So this is the fifth year. And um, yeah, it's just a, your opportunity as a member of the Haskell community or somebody interested in Haskell, if you don't feel like you're part of the community, um, to weigh in on how you think Haskell as a language is, what you think of the community, how things can be improved, all that. And um, I'll do what I've done every year, which is post the results at the end and do a little bit of analysis. So uh, Cam, you asked earlier, what, I, what have I been doing recently? Uh, gearing up for that. So uh, the survey is a little bit different this year to overlap more with some other programming communities. And also looking forward to next year, the Haskell Foundation will likely be taking over the survey. So this year is kind of a transitionary period for that. Nice. Yeah, I was actually just about to ask, like, Fast Haskell Foundation hasn't taken it yet? Not yet. So I've been talking with Andrew Boardman, who's the executive director of the Haskell Foundation, um, and they're definitely interested in taking it over and reshaping it just a little bit. Uh, but yeah, that will happen next year. So this year, it's still just me, um, but I'll continue to 
do what I've done previous years. How much did you charge them to take it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's all for the community. Yes. Um, so yeah, if you're listening to this, please, uh, I'll leave a link in the show notes or you can just head over to haskellweekly.news and there will be a link there. Go take the survey, tell everyone you know to take the survey. Uh, I think we're up to, we're recording this on Friday the 5th and it's up to about eight or 900 respondents. So trying to push that number up. Yeah, uh, I'm guilty of not doing it yet. So I need to step up my game apparently. But that's why we do Haskell Weekly, so we can remember to do things like this. So thanks, Tyler, for that. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's exciting. I'm, I always enjoy it. I just need to sit down and do it. Yeah, it'll take about 10 minutes. Just like Shia LaBeouf, to do it! Yesterday you said tomorrow. That's right. Um, but yeah, that's not the big ticket news from this week. Cam, you want to tee us up? Drum roll, please. Probably like a, yeah, whoever listens to this, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, JHC 9.2.1 has been released. Woo! Ow, ow, ow! So there's a lot of fun, cool things that happen with this release of GHC. Obviously, it's going to take a little bit of time to get, you know, stackage up to date and all that fun stuff. Because, uh, But, yeah, why don't you share, Taylor, since you let me do the announcement. Why don't you share some of the, the highlights that are coming? Sure. So to start, there are just so many new things in this release. Uh, we're not going to have time to get into all of them. Otherwise, this would be like a two hour long episode. But I'll leave a link to the uh, release notes, which I encourage you to go read. We're just going to hit the highlights. So uh, first big one, which isn't um, a change to like the code or anything like that, but a change to the uh, code generator on the back end is that GHC can now produce native code for the Apple M1 architecture, which means all those fancy new MacBooks and MacBook, uh, excuse me, Mac minis, and those new MacBook Pros, uh, you can now compile GHC that will run natively rather than get interpreted through the Rosetta, um, you know, changing from x86-64 into ARM64. So uh, that just means it'll be faster, better, tighter integration. I think there were also a lot of kind of incidental um, changes or improvements to the code generator as a result of this, where needing to differentiate between ARM64 and x86-64 made things more um, like precise. So one of the things is like a Word 8 data type, I think will actually be smaller, like only use uh, eight bits rather than it used to, I think take 64 bits anyway. Go read the release notes. There's way more information about that. Just exciting native on M1. Yeah, so that means uh, Hask community can be more uh, more Apple purchasers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know that M1 Max and M1 Pro look pretty cool. I don't, you know, per their comparisons with like the i9 and whatnot. Yeah, they're super fast. I myself have an M1 Mac Mini at home, uh, and I also have a Windows machine. Also have a Linux machine, so I use GHC on all of those. I haven't yet got 9.2 on that Mac Mini, so I can't, I don't have an experience report for, oh, it's blazing fast or it's super slow, but I expect it to be blazing fast. Yeah, we'll have to uh, check in with you on that next week, see how that's going, a little pet project. Uh -huh, cool, yeah, um, I, uh -oh. I don't know if you can hear Roomba, I just, uh, it's running off in the background. DJ Roomba. DJ Roomba. But yeah, so uh, I know there was a lot of changes in the area of records. Um, you want to talk about some of the language extensions um, that they uh, added and or modified? Yeah, and I apologize in advance if I get any of these wrong. I haven't been paying close attention to all of the proposals and implementations of these things. But yes, there are a lot of changes with records and record fields. And the end result is that you can now write code in Haskell with the more typical record dot field notation that is popular in most object-oriented languages. And you can have that read a real field on a record. So if you define like a person type and they have a name and you can now say person.name and it'll just read that field out. Um, or you can have synthetic fields where it's computed when you call it or something like that. Um, like I said, I haven't been paying super close attention to this, but that's my understanding of it. And this also 
rounds off some of the rough edges when it comes to records where you can have um, multiple fields with the same name and then when you do that dot access into them it will disambiguate based on which you know thing it is that you're uh, calling um, and uh, I think record updates are they also changed in this release I think they're still changing but the idea is that uh, you will be able to do a record update which is in the curly brackets where you say like a nested field in there where you can say person dot name dot first equals something and it'll do a deep update into that field rather than forcing you to like unwrap each level along the way and update the very inner thing that'll, that'll be nice I feel like uh one thing that <laughs> one other language that could use something like that would be uh, at least for like the deep changing of, of fields would be elm yes you gotta like unwrap each section and then go to do the thing and then uh, rewrap it and it's like uh. <laughs> yeah, it's all this boilerplate for basically no reason. And in Elm, you can't even use lenses, which is the common Haskell way around this problem. And maybe the best way to talk about the record updates in GHC 9.2 is that it gets the core language with some extensions closer to what you can currently do with lenses as a library. So I'm sure that people who use Lens may see that as a downside, like, hey, you know, we have this powerful thing that we were able to implement without language support. But I know that a lot of people in the Haskell community are, they shy away from Lenses. And so having it built into the language is a big plus. Yeah, that's been something for us is like, kind of figuring out, all right, what packages do we want to use? And what are the side effects with that? Oh, it's gonna, you know, I use Lenses to, for updating documentation with Swagger. And it's like, all right, what does the dot tilde do? What about the dot tilde curly or question mark? Like, oh yeah, that's what all these do. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, creating some more language support for things like that without having to use lenses could be nice. Um, another thing, one we've already talked about previously uh, in, a, in a previous episode is the GHC 2021 uh, language extension set. And so uh, I think with 9.2.1, that is now a supported thing. Um, and yeah, what, what do you think about that? I'm really excited about this. And in fact, uh, in reading the release notes, I discovered something about this that I didn't know before, which is that when you're defining a Haskell project or package, I should say, in your cabal file or your package.yaml, you typically say what your default language is and you pick one of the language reports. It's either Haskell 98 or it's Haskell 2010. And for the most part, those are interchangeable. Uh, Haskell 2010 isn't a radical departure from Haskell 98. It just shores up some things and enables a couple um, small extensions. But I think with this new release, if you don't specify a default language, you're gonna get GHC 2021 by default, which means a lot of new extensions. They don't actually list the whole extension set here, but there are tens of extensions that this enables. And it's, you know, there was a lot of feedback that went into this, uh, partially motivated by the Haskell survey. So again, please fill that out if you haven't. Shameless plug, I love it. Exactly. Um, but yeah, so it's stuff like, you know, uh, Lambda case or like multi-param type classes. I'm rattling these off, but I don't actually know that these in particular are enabled. but the kind of quality of life improvements that feel like they should be on by default, but haven't been because it's such a conservative language standard. Now they're bundled into this GHC 2021 language set. And I'm really excited about this. Yeah. I know numeric underscores is in there. I was uh, working with a, a buddy and I was like, he enabled uh, that. And I was like, this is weird. Like I just haven't used this before. And he's like, yeah, well it's in GHC 2021. I was like, all right, cool. Let's do it. Uh, so, yeah, I've definitely uh, had my fair share of, like, hmm, this could be nice just to be here. Uh, I think we've got quite a few language extensions ourselves, so it'd be cool to see how many of those overlap with GHC 2021 and how many we're not using, and maybe that would be another helpful thing to, you know, iterate quickly. Yeah, and one of the things I really like about this is that it provides a common base or common subset for the community to kind of rally around. So right now, I think the status quo is that everyone has kind of their own mental checklist of that's an okay extension, that's a bad one, and this one I'm kind of ambivalent about. 
and maybe not for every extension, there are a bunch, but you know, you say undecidable instances and some people are like, ooh, I hate that. Or, oh yeah, that's fine, I'll enable that, whatever. Um, and by having a group of stuff all together in GHC 2021, we can, as a community, just say like, this is what I'm using. You're probably already familiar with all of it. This is our new baseline. All right, let's have all these features and make development life better for us. Yep, exactly. Yeah, so that that's good. Um, that's another great win for uh, GHC 9.2.1. Um, are there any other like topic, talking points? I mean, like you said, we could talk for hours on this and I want to be cognizant of everyone's time, you know, including yours. I know you're a busy man with talking to people over the pond and whatnot. Um, you're busy too working on that new product, but there is one more thing I wanted to talk about, um, which is GHC exact print. And at the top of the show, I was talking about Brittany, the source code formatter. Brittany is actually built on top of GHC exact print, which used to be a separate library. And if you're not familiar with it, GHC exact print is sort of like the pretty printer that doesn't actually make things prettier. All that it does is parse your source file into an AST and then give you back exactly the same thing, hence the name, exact print. This seems kind of useless, but it's actually really useful for doing refactorings. So if you want to parse a file and then say, something that HLint does a lot, for example, is like, if you have an expression where you say, when not something, do this, you can replace that with, unless something, do this. And HLint actually leans on a different tool to do those refactorings, but with GHC exact print, you could implement those types of refactorings by parsing the AST and then transforming the little part of the AST you're interested in and then writing it back out to a file. Or obviously you can use it as the basis for a pretty printer where you parse the AST and then transform not the, um, like not what it means, but what it looks like, and then write that back out to a file. So uh, I mentioned all this, the, the actual change in GHC 9.2 is that exact print is now part of GHC. So it's no longer a separate library. And that just means it'll be more widely available. You're guaranteed it's going to be up to date. Those are good things. Yeah. So in there, in that explanation, you did use a couple acronyms that I wasn't sure of. Um, and for the listeners, I want to make sure that they are also not in the dark there. Um, I think you said AST. Yes. So AST stands for abstract syntax tree. And what that means is typically the, like the source code you have in a file is just a bunch of bytes, their characters, whatever, however you, however you encode them. And then the compiler doesn't want to deal with those bytes directly. It wants to deal with an abstract representation of them. So programming languages are typically, typically pretty complicated, but the same thing is true for like JSON. You have like curly bracket, double quote, something, close double quote, colon, and like, okay, that's great. But really what I'm representing here is JSON object, key name is this and value is this. So an AST is essentially like a abstract representation of the syntax. Gotcha. I feel like there was something else, but I can't quite call it out. And I know it's not an NDA because that's something else. Uh, <laughs> so, well, if whoever's listening and they rem see which one that was and have a question, ping Taylor. He'll, he'll answer it for you because, I mean, you can ping me. I'll research it, but can't guarantee the answer. So Ping you, and then you can ask me, and then I'll tell you, and Perfect. then you can tell them. Yeah, we'll just play telephone with this. That yeah. sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you uh, for kind of diving into those uh, today and sharing with us uh, what really are some of the highlights and, and top points of GHG 9.2.1. Please do go look at the full spec if you're interested in what changed because um, there's a laundry list of things. So uh, definitely check it out. Um, hopefully soon we'll continue to you know get every get stack supporting 9.2.1 and, and all that fun stuff so now now that the, it's officially been released we can kind of wait for that ball to roll for all the the full support for normal uh you know obviously you can still use 9.2.1 but if you want to you know it's a lot easier when stackage has at least a nightly snapshot for 9.2.1 because that means most of the libraries you probably depend on have been updated to support it um, and my expectation 
as someone who maintains a handful of libraries is that upgrading to 9.2 is probably going to be a little bit easier than upgrading to 9.0. Um, from the change from 8.10 to 9.0, there were a lot of internal changes in GHC restructuring and stuff like that. And so that made it hard for libraries that depend on those internals to update. And it seems like there aren't as many with 9.2. Nice. Cool. Well, thank you guys for listening. Uh, yeah. Do you want to do the outro? You want me to do the outro? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I want to add one thing to the outro, and then you can do the normal bit, which is um, if you guys have, you listening, have any questions about, you know, stuff we talk about on this show, or if you have suggestions for things you would like us to talk about, please let one of us know or tweet us at Haskell Weekly. Um, I would really like to get into questions from our listeners and, you know, hey, should we do this or that? Or should we architect things this way or that way? I think Cameron and I have a fair amount of experience working in professional environments with Haskell, and I'd love to share that with the larger community. But it's hard to just jump off of nothing. You know, we need a need a prompt. Yeah, I, w I would agree. Um, yeah. Sounds great to me. Well, awesome. Thank you guys for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. Uh, we are a show about Haskell, so it's in the name. That's pretty cool. Uh, if you guys are interested, please follow us at Haskell Weekly, um, or you can find us online at HaskellWeekly.news. You got it. And uh, as per usual, we are brought to you by my employer, ACI Learning. Uh, if you want to go over to itpro.tv and fill in promo code HaskellWeekly30, you can get 30% off the lifetime of your subscription. So and it's head a over little to confusing ITPro. because our domain is itpro.tv and we were purchased by ACI Learning. So, for well, yeah, they were uh, my previous employer. One of us, one of us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I spent, I've spent a long time there, so I feel like even if I'm not there, it's, you know, I'm still part of it for some reason. Uh, I mean, I did just walk into the building the other day and just walk on <laughs> in. Security's walk really in, light there. lose a ping pong game and leave. I did. I lost. <laughs> Taylor Fossack beat me on November 3rd, around 12.45 p.m. It's not a big deal. We made a plaque, but it's not a big deal. Yeah, it's no biggie. <laughs> uh, I was the reigning champion, but, you know, now I'll cry away. But anyways, thank you guys for listening. We'll catch you guys next week. Peace.